2 and verse 10, For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Can you take it back a bit? <laughs> I have this battle in our home church as well that I feel that I'm being challenged. Yeah. <laughs> modern technology. Now as we come to this verse in Hebrews, I think it's good for us, if we want to understand it correctly, to remind ourselves of the situation in which these people existed in this church. The Hebrew Christians were clearly a persecuted group and we're reminded of this in chapter 10 in verse 34, 33 and 34. Remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shearers with those who were so treated. And it appears from the author's emphasis on Old Testament principles of law and priesthood that a great deal of that persecution was sourced in Jewish opposition to their faith. The Lord Jesus, in his ministry, brought ideas into the, the, the faith that the, the Jews were not familiar with and that they didn't particularly enjoy. They saw the Messiah as a Mess somebody who was going to save the Jews and particularly the Jewish nation. But the Lord Jesus introduced principles into, the, into redemption that didn't sit easily with the Jews. We see their reaction to our Lord Jesus' statements in passages such as Luke chapter 4 and verse 25 through to 26, when he said, But I say to you, in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And all the people in the synagogue um, rebelled, if you like, against him. Because he introduced this idea of a redemption that went beyond Israel, went beyond the Jews. The persecutions here in Hebrews appear to be directed at the assumed inadequacy of the Lord Jesus and his work, and no doubt follow the same pattern as those expressed on the cross. They were belittling Christianity, and they were trying to belitt belittle Christianity uh, on the basis of the inadequacy of its founder in the inadequacies of Christ. His suffering on a Roman cross was a clear witness to that failure as what, what they considered to be a failure. And the mocking label above the cross, this is the king of the Jews, rubbed salt into the embarrassment that the Jews felt with regard to the Lord Jesus. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, 
save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is king of, the, of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. And let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. To these people who said these things, he was a failed Messiah. And the attitude, this attitude was an attitude that persisted through unsaved Jews. And it was a challenge to the emerging church. And this pressure was clearly affecting some amongst the Hebrew Christians. So how uh, were they to respond to these accusations? And the author is here demonstrating to his readers that far more was at stake than the narrow, self-interested and inward-looking views of current Jewish opinions. They are reminded that the man Jesus was there because he was doing what God wanted him to do. It was fitting for him, the word says, for whom are all things and through whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. At the core of the Lord Jesus' work was the fulfillment of God's covenant of redemption, a covenant to bring an end to the works of the devil. And this is important for us to understand. The Jewish nation had indeed been blessed as the people through whom God brought the fulfillment of the covenant about. But the covenant of redemption had a far wider application. The intention of the covenant of grace was the recovery and the salvation of all God's people, not just a few through whom God had chosen to give the privilege of being the channel to bring it about in time and space history. But we do see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honour, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was something that was being done not just for the Jews, but for everyone. The humiliation of the cross had a far greater implication than were evident on that day in Gol oh, gone on Golgotha for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the powers against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces forces of wickedness in the heavenly places Calvary was the culmination of an unseen battle there on Calvary's hill, the Prince of Glory was doing battle with the unseen Prince of this world. In God's purposes for this battle, it was fitting for him, for whom all things are and through whom all things are, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. The sufferings that were to the Jews a clear sign of our Lord Jesus' failure were in fact the necessary means of fulfilling God's purposes. 
Importantly, our text reminds us of the, the initiator of this battle. It is the one for whom are all things and through whom are all things. It is a reminder to us that the purpose and redemption of creation and humanity in particular is the glory of God. So often these days we put ourselves at the, core, at the, at the center of, of the gospel. We're not. God is at the center of the gospel. And the purpose of all that we see occurring in the gospel message is God's glory. And if you go to passages, and this is an aside, and I have to be careful these days of going on asides because my mind doesn't work like it used to. God is demonstrating his grace to the world in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. You can look up the verse if you want to, and it'll make it clearer. But God is demonstrating to the world through the, 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 the cross an administration that is suitable to that life which is to come. In other words, in, this, in the congregation of God's people, we should be demonstrating to our community what heaven is like and is going to be like. One of the great sadnesses of any pastor, and especially one who's getting near the end of his, his uh, days, is to look back at the church and see how the church is plagued, not by people who have the humility of Christ and people who serve and love one another, but by people who want to be in, up the front and who want the glory for themselves and so often become the means of dividing the church and dividing the body and creating problems within the church. And that's why and when we sing that hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, I pour contempt on all my pride. When I look at the humility of Christ, the creator of all things, taking upon himself humanity and then suffering for humanity. And I begin to think about that. Then I pour contempt on all my pride. And so when we come here, we see that God brings glory to himself through the sufferings of his son. He is the one who created out of nothing, who said, let there be, and there was. And he created in order that it should be for his glory. It is for the demonstration and continuance of that glory that the suffering of the Lord Jesus is appropriate. For both he who sacrifices and those who are sanctified, uh, sorry, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And again, behold, I am and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. The sufferings of our Lord Jesus had a purpose, and that purpose was the glory of God. The victory of obedience to God over evil and as a consequence, victory for the people he came to save from the clutches of death was for his father's sake. The things that he suffered, far from being a reason for doubt, are in fact a source of great confidence to the faith of the believer. For it was part of God's perfect plan that he should be made for a little while 
lower than the angels and suffer. And there are three things that the writer wants us to see about the suffering of the Lord Jesus. I'm sure there's more, but there's three that I want to share with you this morning. It was the sufferings of his obedience that made him a perfect sacrifice. And it was the sufferings that he rendered, uh, it was through his sufferings that he rendered the devil ultimately powerless. And it was through his sufferings that he became a suitable high priest. Let us look then, first of all, at the sufferings of his obedience that made him a perfect sacrifice. It was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. When we look at this, one of the things that we must realize is that God's holiness is absolute. As the prophet Habakkuk observes, he says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. God's purity is self-protecting. Just like oil will not mix with water, so God's person will not mix with sin. He will have nothing to do with it. But it's important for us to realize too that this is just not a mechanical separation like oil and water. God separates himself from sin by choice. It's his personal choice to separate himself from sin. It is personal choice to be jealous of his character and to protect his character by separating himself from sin. God chooses not to have anything to do with sin and that we would see as God's judgment on sin. And in this sense, it is fitting for us to have a, such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. It is fitting for us to have somebody who would work on our behalf who is holy, who is innocent of sin, who is undefiled by sin, who is separated from us in the fact that he doesn't participate in sin. A high priest who clearly identifies with the character of God and his holiness and yet also identifies with sinners. The sufferings of our Lord Jesus become a clear and visible sign of that identification. Though he was clearly a man like any other man, a man clearly identified as the son of Joseph and Mary in the flesh, a carpenter's son, a man who suffered hunger and fatigue and temptation just as other people did. Yet he was unlike any other person and that his obedience to God was without question. And because of that obedience, and this is important for us to understand, because of that obedience, he suffered. He suffered. He suffered in that he refused to use his privilege as the Son of God to relieve his needs and his suffering that is common to his earthly body and therefore common to his fallen humanity to relieve his hunger, to demonstrate his divine origins in order to receive the honor of people, to avoid the necessary suffering of the cross, all things that are identified in the temptations of Christ in Matthew. And he refused, 
to use his power to protect himself from these things, from these temptations. Temptations that pursued him throughout his life on earth and resisted, and he resisted because of his delight in his Father's will. It is no accident that when the Lord Jesus teaches us to pray, that we are to begin with our Father in heaven, hallowed or set apart, be your holy name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was our Lord Jesus setting a part of God's will for his life because it was that source of his constant persecution, uh, sorry, which would bring glory to his Father in heaven, which was the source of his constant persecution and eventual death. His suffering, therefore, for his Father's glory made him a suitable sacrifice, a sacrifice that would make purification for sin and also a sacrifice that turned aside the anger of God. For in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. He's not heard like us. We're not heard because of our piety. <laughs> We're sinners. And God's cut off from sinners. You'll have nothing to do with sinners because of his holiness. But Christ, he was heard because of his personal piety. Because he was righteous, he was heard. And because of that, it makes him a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Having said that, I need to remind you that God does hear you. But how does he hear you? He hears you only because we come through his son. That's why we always say at the end of our prayers, in Jesus' name, because that's the only way that we have to come to the Father. But Christ, he was heard for his own piety, for his own righteousness. I often think, a wonderful thing, that heaven couldn't keep him out. Hell couldn't hold him in, but heaven couldn't keep him out. Why? Because he was perfect. So he suffered. And he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. And so he was made the perfect sacrifice. And secondly, it was through his suffering that he rendered the devil ultimately powerless. In verse 14 and 15 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. For those who opposed the faith, the death and humiliation of the Lord Jesus on the cross was the ultimate uh, illustration of his failure. In spiritual terms, it was the attempt to exercise the devil's greatest asset in his opposition to God, the power to bring death through sin, the power to pollute all that God had created for his glory with death, to separate God from his creation and consequently from the pleasure that it brought him, to impose vanity and pointlessness on everything, 
and finally to separate God from his son through death. And in the realms of the rulers and the powers of world forces and the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places to bring glory to the devil and humiliation to God. That was what the devil designed to do on Calvary. He was exercising his power to bring humiliation to God. The Lord Jesus' experience of death was real, both physically and spiritually. And this is self-evident when we read Mark 15 and verse 34. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Death was exercising its ultimate power to separate the Son from the Father. The writer to these Hebrew Christians puts it this way. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. Those prayers and supplications and tears reach their ultimate expression here on the cross as the Lord Jesus dies and cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet immediately following that cry of desperation, he calls out, and this is important for us as Christians if we are to understand the principles of the Christian faith. When Christ feels the ultimate separation from his Father, when everything is emptiness and God is not there, the next thing he cries out is, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is the ultimate expression of faith. When everything is at its darkest, when everything is at its most hopeless, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He doesn't trust his circumstances. He doesn't trust how he feels and that's important for us today when everybody says you must feel good. He doesn't trust what he feels. He trusts what the Father promised him. Even in the darkness, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he was heard. He was heard because of his piety. It was because the Father honoured that faith and piety that belonged to the Lord Jesus that there was no body in the tomb where they buried him. Because it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. And it was through those sufferings that Christ rendered the devil powerless. It was through those sufferings that he rose from the tomb victorious and defeated death. The empty tomb was to become the sign for every believer 
of the certainty of his promise to save those whom he came to save. He has risen the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. He is raised for the justification of his people. Now thirdly, it was through his sufferings that he became a suitable high priest. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. While his suffering as a result of his obedience made him a suitable sacrifice for sin and became the path to victory and glory, it also made him a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. An obedient high priest who could by the offering of himself turn aside the wrath of God. And it was those same sufferings that resulted from his obedience that made him a merciful and faithful high priest since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered. The extent of those temptations are expressed in chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. That's an amazing statement. It's an amazing statement that the Lord Jesus, during his lifetime, was tempted in all things as we are. We have a Saviour who knows and understands us as sinners. Those sufferings brought about by obedience in times of temptation have become to us a real comfort and faith. As sinners, we stand in awe and wonder at the resolve of our Lord Jesus that saw him resist the devil's every effort to turn him from his obedience to his Father in heaven. Every effort of the devil to divide, uh, to, to drive a wedge between him and his father. And remember, we're talking about the man, Christ Jesus. Uh -huh. Tempted in all points like as we are, with the constant effort of the devil, the constant forces of evil, trying to drive a wedge between him and his father, tempting him through his lifetime to just give in once. Just to give in a little. And yet never once he did. Oh, the awesome resolve that the Lord Jesus had to please his Father in heaven. Yet those sufferings that resulted from resisting temptation are a source of real comfort to the believer. Because we have a high priest who, because of his real humanity, can sympathize with our weaknesses. And one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Thus, in a very real sense, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted as our faithful high priest and to make intercession for us. 
a merciful and faithful representative for sinners before God, who is listened to in glory on behalf of sinners because of his righteousness, because of his obedience. And it's because of his obedience that we are heard in heaven. Because of our obedience, he became a faithful high priest for his people. So remember these three things. It was his sufferings, the sufferings of his obedience, that made him a perfect sacrifice. It was through his sufferings that he rendered the devil powerless. It was through his sufferings that he became a suitable high priest on our behalf. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God and to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Trust him. He is able, and he has done all that is necessary on your behalf to reconcile you to God. Let's pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we come in thankfulness of heart this morning to give you our thanks for the Lord Jesus. To thank you for his suffering To thank you that we have a high priest who is able to come to our aid and to present our case before you in heaven. Thank you that we have a high priest who has defeated the devil. Thank you, Lord, that we have a high priest who trusted you, even to death. And, O oh Lord, we pray that by your Spirit you would give us that same trust in him and what he has done because we ask it in his name and we ask it for his glory amen